that dwelling passage together uh, as we continue through this ongoing season of resurrection. Uh, you know, Easter is not just one day. Uh, it is a traditionally and historically 50-day celebration. Uh, and so we continue to celebrate and remember the resurrection as we read about this encounter on the road to Emmaus. Now, last week, one of the things that I mentioned that always gets me about this passage is that moment where it says that Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. I love that. This amazing, this in-depth Bible study with Jesus at the lead, right? What an amazing experience that should be. And though Luke does not tell us in this text uh, the specific passages and teachings that Jesus gave to the disciples, later on, he does show us the teachings that the disciples passed on to others. Uh, last week, we talked about the fact that the Gospel of Luke is part one of a two-volume story. Uh, Luke is part one. It tells the story of, of Jesus' birth and life and ministry and death and resurrection. But part two, by the same author, is the book of Acts. And it tells the story of the early church and the teachings of those disciples that they had received from Jesus and passed on to others and so uh, throughout this season, as we continue uh, looking at this dwelling passage where Jesus instructs his disciples about all the scriptures concerning himself, uh, we're also spending some time with those disciples and what they taught. And so if you have your Bible, you can open up to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 is where we are going today, as we continue listening to what the disciples uh, said as they proclaimed the resurrection. Last week, as we began this, we looked at Peter's first sermon in Acts chapter 2 uh, on, on the day of Pentecost, this Holy Spirit event. Uh, and, and Peter gets up and he speaks. We talked about that last week, his first sermon. Well, today we're going to consider his second sermon that we see in Acts chapter 3. Uh, we'll be picking up in, in verse 12 in just a moment. Um, so as, as, you're, as you're getting there, let me describe the circumstances that Peter uh, preaches this second sermon in. Uh, sometime after the Holy Spirit Pentecost event of Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3 opens with the disciples Peter and John on their way to the temple in Jerusalem. And at one of the gates leading into the temple, there is a man who had been lame from birth. And he was brought there every single day so he could sit right outside the entrance and, and, and beg and ask for, for money as, as he needed as people would go in. And so whenever Peter and John come toward that entrance, and see him there, he, he asks them for money, just like he asks everyone else. Now, I'm sure that Peter and John can remember that story that Jesus told about a good Samaritan, right? And those people who had just passed by the one who was on the side of the road. So they do not pass by. I love how, how Luke describes it. It says they stop and they look right at they give their attention to him. And then Peter says to the man, I do not have any money to give to you, but I'll give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And then Peter reaches out his hand, helps the man up, and this man is healed. It's this amazing moment, and I love how Luke describes all that happens here. It says that the man jumped up to his feet and began walking around, praising God. And then when the people saw it, they all come running to see more closely, right? So you've got jumping and walking and running. There's all this motion happening. It's an exciting moment. And so the crowd gathers around, amazed at what had just happened, and that's when Peter begins to speak. So let's read, beginning in verse 12, Acts chapter 3, verse 12. When Peter saw this, he said to them, 
fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you instead. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. That he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to him. Listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from the people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all people on earth will be blessed. And so when God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for the gift of life and resurrection. God, I pray that as we consider the words of your scripture together today, that you would sharpen our minds and soften our hearts, that we might know you and love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So here we have another story of proclaiming resurrection. Another sermon of Peter's. And so I want to do the same thing that we did together last week. First, I, I want to just take a look at what it is that Peter says at, at, at his sermon, and, and particularly the, the passages, the scriptures that he points to, that he draws from as he proclaims resurrection. Uh, but then I also want to reflect on what it is that he says as an exhortation to us and also an example for us. An exhortation to us, right? What does this sermon say to us today? But also an example for us. Uh, what can we learn from Peter and his proclamation as a people who are also called to proclaim resurrection in our own lives? And so let's jump in and consider this together. Uh, the circumstances for Peter's preaching uh, this time are, are this man who had been lamed from birth and is now jumping up and down for joy, right? That, that is what happened. Those are the circumstances that led him to say, listen, fellow Israelites. And so Peter begins his, uh, his sermon, his address, by, by talking about this. He addresses this man jumping up and down, and he asks his audience a question. He says, why do you stare at us as if 
by our own power and godliness. We made this man walk. Why are you looking at us as if we had done this? And then he goes on in verse 16 to, to answer his own question. He says to them, by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. So this is the, the basic claim of the sermon that, that Peter is preaching here. What you see is the work of Jesus, who is the Messiah. What you see here is the work of Jesus. That is the basic claim of what Peter is declaring. But as soon as he says this, there, there are three layers that open up. There are three different stories that he's speaking into. S three different stories of restoration at the heart of this sermon. So first, there's the, the story, the, the layer, the story of this man, right? He had been lame from birth, but now, in the name of Jesus, he jumps and walks and praises God. Right? That's, that's one layer. That's the thing that everyone has seen. But then Peter introduces, there's, there's another layer. There is the story of Jesus himself. And in verses 13 to 15, Peter retells that story. He says to them, you handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate. You disowned the holy and righteous one. You killed the author of life. But God has raised him from the dead. This is another story of restoration, right? A story of resurrection. The story of Jesus, right? That's another layer that, that, that Peter is, is unpacking here, unfolding here. But there is also a third story. A third layer of restoration. And that's the story not only of Peter's audience right there in the moment, but it's the story of the restoration of everything, of all things. In verses 17 and on, Peter expands to this story of the people right in front of him and beyond. He says, Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance as you did, as did your leaders. But this is how God has fulfilled what he foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. So repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing might come. I love that. He goes on to say, that he may send the Messiah who's been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his prophets, right? To restore everything. This is the ultimate story of restoration. You've got the, the man who was lame, and is now jumping for joy. You have Jesus who had died, but is now living. And you also have the story of the restoration of all things that is yet to come. Peter un unfolds yet another layer of, of this great story of restoration. And I want to linger with this for a little while. But, but first, before we come back to that, let's pay attention to some of the scriptures that, that Peter is drawing from as he preaches here, right? I mean, that's, that's one of the questions that's before us through this, is what passages, what scriptures are the disciples looking to as, as they proclaim resurrection? Uh, very likely the teachings received from Jesus that we've read in our dwelling passage, the very passages that Jesus explained concerning himself. So Peter kind of summarizes the, the passages that he's drawing from down in verse 25 when he says to his audience, you are heirs 
of the prophets and the covenant God made with your fathers. Right? So throughout his sermon, throughout his address, Peter is drawing from the fathers and the prophets. The fathers and the prophets. Notice back in verse 13, the very beginning as he just started speaking, Peter says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus. Right from the start, Peter is saying that what has happened in Jesus is in continuity with what has been happening from the very beginning. Uh, Peter's pointing all the way back to the book of Genesis, the very first book in the whole Bible where God called and covenanted with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, And he's telling the people that these very covenants with their forefathers have found their fulfillment in Jesus. That that this is all one story from the very beginning, and it all comes to Jesus. And he spells this out even more in, in the second half of verse 25 by quoting a specific promise made to Abraham. He says, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be Blessed. This is something that's reiterated to Abraham multiple times. Genesis 12, 22, 26. God keeps saying this. Through your offspring, all will be blessed. And then in verse 26, Peter connects this to Jesus. When God raised up his servant, he sent him to bless you. Right? Peter's drawing from these early covenants with the fathers, saying that promised offspring who would bring blessing, he's come. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus is the one who was promised, and he's here. Peter's pointing all the way back to that. He's drawing from these covenants with the fathers. But Peter's also drawing from the prophets, Right? We've already heard him refer to, to this multiple times throughout the passage, all that had been foretold and promised by the prophets. In verse 22, he gets specific. He points to Moses, who said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people, and you must listen to everything that he tells you. And so Peter is saying, that prophet who has literally been raised up from the dead, has come. It's Jesus. So listen to him. Listen to the story of Jesus. Listen to the words of Jesus. This is that prophet who was spoken of. And then in verse 24, he goes on to mention Samuel and all the prophets, right? Samuel was the very first prophet to anoint a king over Israel. Samuel was the first one to offer the promise of a coming Messiah through the line of David. So Peter is saying, Jesus is that promised Messiah. He's the one who has come to rule and reign in the kingdom of God. So he says Samuel, but then it says, and all the prophets, right? He kind of just does this catch-all Another prophet who Peter does not mention by name, but there are so many echoes throughout his sermon, is the prophet Isaiah. So much of what Peter says throughout the sermon uh, echoes back to what Isaiah had claimed long before. I want you to pay attention to some of the language that Peter uses. That, that echoes back to Isaiah. The first is the title servant. The title servant. In verse 13, Peter says that God has glorified his servant, Jesus. Again, towards the end of his sermon, in verse 26, he says, God raised up his servant. Uh, this word servant is, an, is, is clearly an excellent description of, of Jesus. Jesus came to serve, not to be served, right? 
Jesus came and, and he washed his disciples' feet, and he tells them, do the same to one another. Jesus is a servant. This is a very good description of Jesus, and yet it is not often used as a title for Jesus. We don't see it actually as a title referring to Jesus very many times, but we do see it here. Peter refers to Jesus multiple times as God's servant who has been glorified. And this is a major theme throughout Isaiah. There are many passages, several passages in Isaiah that over the years have come to be known as the servant song. The servant songs. I wish we had time to look at every one of them. Uh, we'd be here for hours. That could be a whole sermon by itself. That could be a whole sermon series by itself. I won't do that to you today. Uh, but these servant songs are found in Isaiah 42, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 50, and then the longest and most well-known of these servant songs is in Isaiah 52 and 53. You're probably familiar with some of these words, especially from the last of the servant songs. It's in this last one that we read about a servant who was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows who took up our pain and bore our suffering. One who was pierced for our transgressions. It says, by his wounds, we are healed. Isaiah 53. This last and longest servant song ends with these words from Isaiah 53, verses 11 and 12. After he suffered, the servant, after he suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. This passage from Isaiah maps right on to what Peter is proclaiming in this sermon in Acts chapter 3. As he describes Jesus as God's servant who has been glorified, who has been raised up. Jesus is the righteous servant. Jesus is the righteous servant who suffered. He is the righteous servant who poured out his life unto death. He is the one who bore the sins of many. He is the one who made intercession for the transgressors. Remember when he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. He prayed for the very ones who were putting him to death. He is the one who has justified many. Peter is, is living and breathing the prophet Isaiah as he describes God's servant, Jesus. This is how he explains what the prophets had foretold about how the Messiah would suffer. It's Jesus. He is the one. But, but there's more. There's more. There's some other ways that he's echoing from the prophet Isaiah. Look at some of the other language titles that he uses for Jesus. In verse 14, he describes Jesus as the holy and righteous one who was disowned, handed over, killed. This phrase is also an echo from Isaiah, one of the primary ways throughout the prophet Isaiah that he describes or refers to God is with the title, the Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel. It, it appears a couple other places, but it's very unique 
to Isaiah. It appears over 25 times throughout the prophet Isaiah, the Holy One of Israel. One of the places that most closely echoes what Peter says here in Acts chapter 3 is Isaiah 37, when the prophet asks the people, who is it that you have ridiculed and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes in pride? Against the Holy One of Israel. And here Peter says, you disowned the Holy and Righteous One, and ask that a murderer be released instead. By using these titles to refer to Jesus' servant, Holy One, Peter's drawing from Isaiah as he describes the cross and the resurrection. Jesus is the servant who suffered. Jesus is the Holy One of Israel who was rejected. He is telling everyone there, Jesus is the one that makes sense of all of these passages, all of these scriptures. It is in him that they are fulfilled. But then Peter continues. He continues, right? He he keeps echoing themes from Isaiah as well. As he continues his sermon and transitions from the specific story of Jesus to the story of everything, right? The story of everything. Peter goes on to address his audience directly. Fellow Israelites, verse 17, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God has fulfilled what he has foretold through all the prophets by saying that this Messiah would suffer. And he invites them. He says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. So often we stop there, right? The gospel is ultimately about me getting my sins wiped away. Peter keeps going. Repent so that your sins may be wiped out so that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. God does not only want us to be clean and free from sin, he wants us to be refreshed and restored. The gospel does not just take sin from us, it gives life to us. That's the good news. So often we have only told half of the story. That it's all about not sinning. It's all about getting myself cleaned off and taken care of. God is inviting us into a whole new life. He is not only wiping away sin, he is giving us times of refreshing. Notice, again, this this echoes Isaiah and Isaiah 30. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel, says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. I wonder if Peter is thinking about this passage as he says, Repent so that your sin may be wiped away and times of refreshing might come. And repentance and rest. How many of us have received a gospel that really just leads to a lot of work? A lot of things that we feel like we should do or not do. In repentance and rest is your salvation. We would become new people if instead of working for a new life, we rested in the life that God gives. But Peter doesn't even stop there. Because this isn't just about people, individuals, having their sin wiped away, or individuals being refreshed. He goes on in verse 21. 
heaven must receive him, Jesus, this servant, until the time comes for God to restore everything. Until the time comes for God to restore everything. This is what God is doing. And again, there are echoes from Isaiah. It is towards the very end of the prophet Isaiah 65. The prophet says, See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem, take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Peter says he is waiting until the time when he will come to restore everything. See, I will create new heavens and new earth. This is the very same language that is used in the book of Revelation when it describes that ultimate end of all things. The gospel is about the renewal, the restoration of all things. So often, we've heard the gospel as an invitation for us to wait around until we can get to heaven. But Peter says just the opposite here. Jesus is waiting in heaven until he can come here and restore everything. That's the gospel. He's coming here to restore us, to restore the whole world. We're not just trying to get out of here. He's coming to make all things new. He is in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything. This is the sermon that Peter preaches. Jesus is the one who makes sense of all of these things, the covenants with the fathers, the promises of the prophets. Jesus makes sense of it all. And so, how is this sermon an exhortation to us and an example for us today? Well, as I think of it as an exhortation to us, I can't help but notice all of the you language that Peter uses as he directly addresses his audience. He looks at them and he, he says, very straightforward, you handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One. You killed the author of life. Now again, we weren't there 2,000 years ago. We didn't do those things but we, I said this last week, have absolutely lived in ways as if God were better off dead. We have lived in ways that forsook him, forgot him. Not all that different than they did. But as much as Peter just drills this in, you did this, you did this, you did this, but God, raised him up. Four times, Peter says, you disowned him. Peter knows what it's like to disown Jesus. He did it three times. Four times he tells them, you did this. You disowned him. You killed the author of life. But it does not matter how many times we have forsaken God God can turn things back around. But God raised him up. And so whether it is something that has happened to us, like the man who was lame from birth, or something that has happened by us, that, that, that's something that we have done, like the people who put Jesus to death, God is coming to restore 
all things. Whatever pain you've experienced, be it emotional, physical, there is coming a day when he will restore all things. Whatever shame or guilt you have, whether rightly or wrongly, he's coming to restore all things. We need not live in shame anymore or fear. He is coming to restore all things. This is the exhortation to us. Repent so that your sin may be wiped away so that times of refreshing may come. Because he's coming to restore all things. Let your heart be refreshed by him. This is the invitation for us to turn our lives toward him, receive the life that he offers. What is the example for us as we look at Peter proclaiming resurrection here? We'll remember the circumstances. Peter was wandering along, going about his daily life, heading into the temple, and he saw the person in need. And he said, I, I don't have what you're looking for. I don't have money to give you, but I will give you what I do have. And in the name of Jesus, he invited that man to walk. This gospel is a gospel of restoration. And Peter stepped forward in the name of Jesus to, take, to make restoration here with this man. What are the places in our life where we might be able to in the name of Jesus, to bring some restoration to this world. Maybe it is some, you know, maybe you do come across someone and you do have some money. All right. In the name of Jesus, receive this. Maybe it's someone who's discouraged and hurting. In the name of Jesus, receive this word of encouragement. Maybe it's just your everyday nine-to-five job. In the name of Jesus, do that work. We proclaim resurrection by res beginning the process of restoring the world in the name of Jesus trusting that he will complete it because he's coming to restore all things. Where are the places where you might bring a little restoration to the world in the name of Jesus? If we can find those places and take those steps, we too can be a people who proclaim resurrection in the name of Jesus. May it be so. Amen.